In 1871, Darwin wrote a letter to Joseph Dalton Hooker, putting forth the idea that the original spark of life could have begun in a warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc. present, so that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. Abiogenesis, the study of how life on our planet could have arisen from inanimate matter, has yielded many theories, including an alien race seeding life on Earth. However, uh, Darwin made his argument from homology and morphology, essentially looking to comparative anatomical structures and the way they change. Well, this argument has been utterly blown out of the water. The idea was this, well, look at a gorilla. It seems to have arms like you, seems to have a head like you. Doesn't that show that you come from some sort of a common ancestor? The same things were done with other animals. In fact, today evolutionists will tell you that whales came from a pig-type creature that existed before the whales. Why? Well, because they're mammals, and so mammals started on the land. So the fish came onto land, and the land went back into the water, and they became whales. And a lot of the things they're looking at are, are morphology and homology. They're looking at comparative anatomical structures. This argument is a complete loser argument. It's a loser argument because genetics is proving to us that this is completely false. There are similarities of design structure found within the world that God has created. What does it really prove? A common designer. Mm -hmm. It's a common designer. We have a common designer that has built in certain infrastructural design components into all the diff different animals. Evolutionists will say, well, we're this percentage related, but guess what? We're almost that closely related genetically to a banana as well. <laughs> so it's far more complicated than the evolutionists are willing to tell us. The third one was they simply could not accept a Christian worldview. So they have to accept by faith a, a system even though they don't have the foundations to prove the basic assumptions. They accept their assumptions by faith, even as we accept our assumptions. But the, the layering above that is quite interesting to me. Um, it's very thinly bedded. That is due to, um, to an explosive eruption. The, the volcano was what it was. It, it, the lava flow rolled out of the, out of the um, crater and then came down this way. But this explosive eruption just boom, it went up, and then as it came back down, it, it went probably out as a pyroclastic flow, it's called. And it, as it came down, it just shot out in this direction, probably in all directions and laying down one after the other, within seconds, one layer after another, uh, the, these laminae. Now, you know, when I was a geology student, when I was, I was taught that whenever you see these fine little gradations like this, it's layer, a winter-summer couplet, that represents a year. And if you went over here to this cliff, you'd see millions of those layers. So obviously, it took millions and millions of years. No, it didn't. It probably took four hours or two hours, I mean, it just happened right now. Just boom, boom, boom. With a catastrophe, things can happen in a hurry. Things that we are taught to assign great ages to can happen in a hurry. This reminds me of, of Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. Of course, it's erupted numerous. The solid lava dome, um, that rock has been dated with radioisotope data. But you know how old that lava at Mount St. Helens dates? No, how old? It dates at 2.4 million years. And many of the, the recent volcanoes that have gone off, from Vesuvius to Krakatoa to Pompeii to just name them, um, they've all been dated. And every one of those recent volcanoes has dated millions and millions what, what, of years What's old. the problem? Is, is this well, a faulty dating method? I think method? the method is wrong. Uh, the, the, the measurements are precise. The equations are correct. Everything about it is right. But the theory, it's based on, based on the assumptions behind the theory, I think those are wrong. Darwin has often been presented as an open-minded Christian, an unbiased naturalist in search of answers when he came to Galapagos. But by the time he arrived here, his opinion was firmly set on two key issues. First, Darwin had rejected the biblical record of history and origins. In his autobiography, Recollections of the Development of My Mind and Character, he writes, Whilst on board the Beagle, 
I gradually come by this time to see that the Old Testament, from its manifestly false history of the world, was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. Darwin brought two books with him on the voyage of the Beagle. One of them was Principles of Geology by Sir Charles Lyell, presenting the view that the Earth was vastly older than the Bible claimed. Lyell based his assumptions on uniformitarianism, or the idea that the present is the key to the past. Put simply, the process that we observe today have continued at the same rate since the beginning of time and account for most of the changes we see, such as rivers slowly eroding away vast areas like the Grand Canyon. Not only did Darwin reject the biblical record by the time he reached Galapagos, but he embraced Lyell's uniformitarianism and later claimed his work to be half out of Lyell's brain. These were the glasses Darwin was wearing when he came here. And for his model of evolution to work, hundreds of millions of years are required. Evolutionists work by the premise that the present is the key to the past. Uniformitarianism. Uniformitarian thinking. And at present, we see that the moon is receding farther and farther away from the Earth year by year. I mean, it's a measurable rate. Well, you know, if the, if the Earth were millions and millions of years thinking, and at present, we see that the moon is receding farther and farther away from the Earth year by year. I mean, it's a measurable rate. Well, you know, if the, if the Earth were millions and millions of years old, millions of years ago, the moon would be much closer than now. Assuming the same rate, which is what evolution Assuming, is Assuming, yeah, present rates and present processes. But if the moon were closer, my goodness, what would it do to the tides? I mean, if the moon were, you know, 100,000 miles closer or so, then... Um, the tides would be huge. They would maybe wash over the continents. Life would be impossible. The tidal zone where most of the life exists in that high energy zone, well, where would they live? Because that zone is moving so far. Uh, we're surrounded by oceans filled with salt. Uh, is there a message that the salt gives us as we look at the dates, the chronologies of the Galapagos Island? As the rain falls on the ocean, and the ocean's salt content is building up year by year. Well, it's a simple calculation, it's a simple way of thinking. If the present is the key to the past, if uniformitarian thinking is correct, then the oceans are gaining the same amount of salt every year. And, well, we can measure how fast it gains the salt now, and we can measure how much salt is in the ocean now. And just a simple division, the, you can tell how old the ocean is just by the salt content and the rate of introduction of salt. If the Earth were millions of years old, as the evolutionists say, or billions of years old, if life evolved in the salty sea, then that would mean that the oceans would be so choked with salt that life would be impossible. Nothing could live in that salty of an ocean. So it looks like the oceans are another message that the Earth was created not very long ago, just like the Bible says. In 1972, astronomers Carl Sagan and George Mullen pointed out what is now known as the faint young sun paradox. According to the standard solar model, stars similar to the sun will gradually brighten over their lifetimes. Some 3.5 billion years ago, the time when life has been said to have appeared in the sea, the sun would only be around 70 to 75 percent of its current capacity. A staggering reality that would mean the Earth would essentially be a block of ice. A far cry from Darwin's warm little pond. I wondered why these glaring inconsistencies went relatively overlooked. Neither the sun nor the moon supported a multi-billion year old.